Hi there. Uh, hi, Rhiannon. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited for this conversation today. Good morning. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, you know, if you can maybe just add uh, in the comments and share with us where you're joining us from, that would be awesome. It's always nice to see people, you know, joining us again from all parts of the world. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, just a little bit about Product Power Play. Um, it is a LinkedIn Live series, and we host industry leaders like Rihanna and herself, uh, where we talk about, in a very candid way, um, some very important inflection points that have shaped these leaders' careers. And we often cover both life as well as career. And I am Baski Mukherjee, and I'm the founder of PM Dojo, where um, our mission is to help women and minorities fast track their career in product and tech. We help women transition into product with the help of our accelerator program with experience. We also help PMs and product leaders move up into C-suite and more leadership roles faster. Um, and I'm also really excited about a new program that we launched called Trailblaze Her, which is specifically for women to navigate life and work. So again, if you're interested, put that in the comments and I'm happy to share um, and talk to you about it um, another day. But let's get started with today's episode. Um, and we do have a small Q&A at the end. So again, if something resonates or if you have a question, uh, put them in the comments and I would be happy to take them uh, towards the end. So let's get started. Again, Rihanna, I am so excited. I know we've been talking about it for seems like months to have you here and finally this is happening so super super cool a um, little bit about rihanna you can always check her profile on linkedin but just a few things if um, i can summarize and do justice to um, rihanna's amazing career over so many years rihanna you worked at the prime minister's office so that's a <laughs> story by itself You've led product innovation at companies such as uh, Shazam. You've worked at BBC. You've worked at WEND. You are um, currently the chief product officer at Clue, and you are disrupting women's health, which is something so important and something that we don't talk about a lot. You're also a wonderful mom to three wild, beautiful kids who are sleeping <laughs> right now. <laughs> Let's not wake them up. Let's stay that way. <laughs> yes, let's not wake them up. Um, and yeah, I don't even know if there's anything that you have not done. So let's get started. Uh, thank you so much again for joining. Um, and Axel, this is for you. Thank you so much for introducing Rihanna and I. Um, really, I owe this to you and uh, next coffee or lunch is on me. Uh, so let's get started, uh, Rihanna. Let's kind of go back and start with your career. You know, you've worked in marketing, you have worked in politics, you've also, you work in tech right now. Um, from where you started back in the day to where you are right now in the C-suite, you know, as the chief product officer at Clue, what can you think of some of the inflection points that have shaped um, you and where you are today? Yeah, this is um, this is a great question. When, when you mentioned that we might want to talk about this, I really had to stop and think because uh, I feel very, I feel very much like the thing that you know we we can learn from everything and every role that we have, and, and that's really been my experience. Um, and I certainly couldn't imagine, you know, I mean, this shows my age, but you know, 20 years ago when I started working after university, I, I didn't I didn't even know that product management and technology existed. Like the, the roles that I have had over the last few years, I, I literally didn't know were possible for um, all of my youth, if that makes sense. Um, I think for me, the first major inflection point was probably my first management role, which was um, when I was 27, I um, started working uh, for a, um, a place called the Office of the Leader of the Opposition. It's a very, it's a very um, old school title in, in New Zealand. So I'm from New Zealand, that's the funny accent folks that you can hear. Um, and uh, that was my first role managing a team. And that was really a major moment for me because I felt this it was like this click in my soul. You know, I had, um, I've got quite a lot of energy as, a, as an individual and, and I always, you know, bring a lot of energy to any role that I'm doing and I feel like I can run for quite a long time on my own. 
and like most people, I eventually start to wind down, right? I, I can't keep going forever. But I found that with a team, I could keep going forever. We could just, you know, together, the power of the team is so much more than of when we're on our own. Well, that's for me anyway. And so that that kind of feeling and realization of that we could just go and go and go and keep achieving and keep delivering was really exciting. And it was also the first time that I really started to get close to digital again i mean showing my age a bit but it was some time ago and it was really i remember on my first day <clears throat> the chief of staff who had hired me who was an amazing man and who i learned so much from about management said to me oh and by the way you'll also be responsible for the web and everything and the web strategy and i said okay <laughs> that sounds great i'll need to hire someone because i knew nothing about web or web strategy or anything but over the those four years that um i was there i fell deeply in love with digital and the ability to be close to the person on the other side. The thing that always frustrated me about when I had been in sort of more classical marketing or communications roles was the, the distance between me and the person who I was trying to communicate with. And digital just collapses that distance down, which is what I really love about it. I think then the um, next major inflection point was um, when I was at the BBC and I transitioned. Um, I was that was I was in marketing, but really started to work on pure digital products and to really Again, I, I fell even more in love again, it was this point about the relationship, right? So the thing that had frustrated me about marketing was that we would spend this time trying to understand how we might address what people are interested in, but then you kind of send the stuff out and that's it. Whereas in a product, it's a relationship. And I really wanted that relationship and the ability to have that two-way path. And I was very fortunate to um, work with an amazing group of people there. And, and there was a, a fantastic um, guy who was moving back to the US to be the CPO at Shazam and who said, hey, come join my product team, who took a huge chance on me. And I'm forever grateful to him for that. Um, and forever grateful to his uh, wider team who took a chance on me too, because <laughs> it was my first role of product. Um, and that was a massive inflection point in terms of that was the moment where I switched from marketing to product. Um, and look, you know, I, I speak very openly and honestly about this because I was really a bad product manager <laughs> for, the first, for the first good while. You know, I was, I had a very miserable first 13 months. I worked 12 hours a day, six days a week. I couldn't get out from underneath the overwhelm. I just, every mistake that people talk about PMs shouldn't do, don't build what sales says, don't do this, don't do it. I did everything, everything that you could, that, that you know, that you're told and that people laugh about only terrible product managers would do that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> um, and so it was a really, um, it was a really difficult and um, steep learning curve to, to shift domain and to really, and it, and it knocked my confidence enormously, right? I'd gone from being someone who I felt, I felt I was quite competent and I knew what I was doing and I was very senior in my marketing career and, and to realizing, because I knew I wasn't the product manager I wanted to be. I could see my, my peers and colleagues who I could see that they were, you know, that, I thought that's what I want to do. What, what's, what's the gap? And it really took, um, I had to really refine myself and refine what I can bring to a role and realize that I think, you know, that um, again, this thing about the team, I, I remember reading Marty Kagan's first book at the time and, and, and like crying and thinking, well, I'm I just, I'm not that, I can never do that. Who can, and I've come to the view now, which I think you would disagree with, but that actually no one can be that perfect product manager. A team, a, a, an effective high-performing product team can do the whole job the whole spectrum and that's what I aim to build with my teams now but I don't expect any single individual PM to do the whole thing all the time themselves um, but I didn't you know I didn't know that and I didn't give myself that permission at the beginning because I just saw all the things I was doing wrong um, but once I found my way back through through some very helpful um, you know feedback from uh, one of my colleagues uh, gave me a, a, a tough piece of feedback but it was very instructive about you know he, he said look at that point, I'd made it to VP because I had shipped value that was driving a lot of value for the business, which is great. But I still knew there was a gap. Like I'd ship, I could on paper, I could show, but I knew I wasn't. I don't know. I could feel the gap. And uh, and he said to me, "Look, you're 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 a VP now. You have to bring insight. That's what you need to bring." And it was like a light bulb went off in my brain. But that's what I did in marketing. You know, that's how I was brought value was by bringing insight, and that's where my kind of hard skills lay. And so that was how I finally found my way back to myself and found that I could really fall in love with product and um, feel that I could deliver value. So that was a, another huge inflection point. Um, and then um, we moved home to New Zealand after we had our first child. We had our first kid in the US um, and we had, we had thought, oh, well, maybe we'll stay till he's about school age, but like Kiwis everywhere. <laughs> we were just on the plane back home as soon as we had a little kid. Uh, and then I um, I ended up at the, at the role at the end after, after a couple of other roles in New Zealand. And that was my first C-suite role. And, and really very, um, you know, I had spent a lot of years sort of bobbing at that 
just one below the C-suite. You know, the, 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 the lieutenant who the C-suite person really leans on and who delivers, delivered out of my skin, always delivered what was needed, always there, always got it done, wasn't in the role. <laughs> and, um, and I, you know, I'd, I'd spent quite a lot of time thinking about what does it take to move to the role and what is the difference between what I was doing then and how that worked. And so then at the end was the first step into that role. And, um, and I just, oh my goodness, I loved it. I mean, it was such a great experience, a wonderful company, wonderful people, and really a great, a great opportunity to finally feel like it all came together in terms of the learnings and the mistakes I'd made and the things I'd learned along the way, bring it together and help build a team that could then execute on this vision of what product can be as a whole team. Um, and so then after um, three years at, at, um, at Vend, we, as part of the management team, that exited the business. It was, an, it was a really wonderful outcome for the business and for everybody involved. Um, and then it was clear it was time for me to, you know, to, to perhaps commit to a totally new thing or, or have an opportunity to move. And it, that was the point where Clue got in contact with me. And, you know, for me, um, I, I mentioned that, that first kid that we had in California. And um, actually, I, you know, I'd spent my entire youth thinking, oh, you know, mustn't get pregnant. It's so easy to get pregnant. And then um, you know, the thing that we told, just look at my husband and I'll be pregnant. Uh, and then actually it turned out it was really, really hard for us to get pregnant. And um, we went through the fertility treatment process in the US, God bless America, and their liberal approach to fertility treatments and fertility drugs, um, which was how we ended up with our beautiful son. Um, but it was a real, it was, you know, when you have a fertility struggle and actually so many more people do than anyone ever talks about, it's a very deep, it's a very deep moment around your identity and around what you, th what, what I thought, you know, what we thought our family was going to be, what our marriage was going to be. Suddenly, everything that we had envisaged was potentially going to go in a different direction. And it really, going through that process was very, um, I was really struck by, it's all data, it's about data. <laughs> so fertility process is about understanding your body <clears throat> and tracking an enormous amount of data at every single point in the cycle and that's how fertility clinics help you and help you get pregnant uh, and i was i was sort of i was astounded and a bit ashamed and shocked that here i was in my you know my mid to late 30s i'd worked for a prime minister i'd worked all over the world been married for a very long time you know i was a vp at product in silicon valley and i actually didn't know how to get pregnant <laughs> you know like i didn't really know and really understand all the bits but i could see that through understanding that data and understanding it then that was how you could get on top of it. And I kept thinking through the whole process because very, it's a very stressful, very demanding, very intense process. I thought, I don't, if I hadn't known this, could I have avoided this? And so when we wanted to try again for, for baby number two, I was like, I'm going to track religiously everything. I'm going to understand what's going on and take control of my health and take control of this process. Because I can't, you can't control whether or not you do conceive, but you can control understanding all the context and circumstance and all those things. And did that and we, we um, conceived baby number two without any help. And then um, still wanted one more. <laughs> and um, we had baby number three when I was 40 with no intervention because of this really intense focus on standing and tracking. And so when Clue came along, which is, the, you know, I, I know very personally how um, life-changing understanding your health and taking charge of that can be, you know, not, I mean, any which way, you know, not everybody has to have kids. If people want to not have kids, having that control is also equally important. And so, um, so it was a very, it was a great, I just felt really excited to have the opportunity to bring my professional experience together with something I had very personally lived and hopefully contribute to people who were living their own journeys around their health. Wow. <clears throat> I know I, I, we talked about it, you know, when we first met Rhiannon, but I think listening to you again and all these little details that you shared again, thank you so much for sharing that because I know um, it, it's, it's not easy. Uh, oftentimes it's even considered a taboo topic to be talking about this, right? Like I remember yeah. I, I had shared something a few years ago and one of the social media platforms actually blocked my post because it was considered, you know, not in line with their guidelines. And I'm like, I'm not saying anything. It's just women's health topic. I mean, why? But yeah, so th thank you again. I feel honored uh, to be sharing this space, um, listening to you and I think talking about what you've gone and through. I, I think it's important that we do, right? I mean, and you know, there, I don't know the number of times, I have a really strong memory of being in the office in New York and having had a really intense meeting with our CEO and um, and then 
and then going to the bathroom and I got my period and you know crying in the bathroom and being like I don't care like that meeting that's like who can work it you know everything pales in comparison and like when I tell people about crying in the bathroom because I got my period and I wasn't pregnant again so many women are like <laughs> you know yeah right it's a it's a I don't know there's something we go through these things and we feel so alone because it feels so intense and it's so bound up and all sorts of crazy complex ideas we have, um, but we're not alone. And actually so many of us experience it. And I think it's really helpful to, to just say it because, you know, it takes away, it, sunlight takes away, nothing is, as, nothing is as intense as it seems when you can share it, you know, so. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, there were so many things in that first question that you shared, I was just kind of taking a few notes here and I have a few follow-up questions, Rihanna. And, and folks who are joining us, you know, please add your questions in the comments. I would love to take them as well as we kind of go through um, our session today. So you mentioned about not being a good PM or you feeling like you're not a good PM and you did all the things that um, are probably more widespreadly known today not to do. I think back 20 years ago, these things were not known. I, 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 can, I can't even count how many times I made some of those mistakes. Um, and I've been pretty close to getting fired early on in my career because of some mistakes that were actually very, very costly. But for me, they were a very fertile ground to learn and unlearn and really be on the ground. But what I want to ask you, Rhiannon, is what made you kind of still pull through? Like if you were kind of finding these gaps or if you were comparing yourself to your peers, do you not give up? Well, this is a good question. I mean, part of it was um, a little bit of pride. I mean, I'd thrown in my entire marketing career. I'd moved my husband and me to a totally different country. It was a little bit of me that thought, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, I need to, need to get my act together, <laughs> um, uh, which was a part of it. But also I just felt like, I felt like surely this can be, you know, I can see that people can do it. I wanted to figure it out. You know, I was feeling pretty rubbish about the stuff that I wasn't doing well but I could see that it was there and that it wasn't impossible and that I so I wanted to I just I really love learning and I really love you know figuring stuff out and maybe you know being able to do something that before I wasn't able to do and so I just just like a dog with a bone I didn't want to let it go I didn't want to give up you know I thought if, if I'm if this is not going to work out I want to be able to look myself in the mirror and say I tried everything and I gave it my all and okay it wasn't for me not like, oh, it got a bit hard and I sort of sidled off back to what I was comfortable with. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be able to, because for me at the end of the day, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I'm, I'm actually like, I'm in, super internally driven in terms of, you know, I look at, I look in the mirror at, at the end of every day and I know whether or not I've done a good job or if I've succeeded or I've, you know, not handled an interaction as well as I should have, or if I've done something well, or I don't really, I mean, it's nice when other people give me feedback, but it's my own integrity that really matters at the end of the day. Um, and I, I know whether, when I've done a, a good job or a bad job, or if I've kind of half-assed something, or if I've really done. And so I just, you know, it was my own, I couldn't, I didn't, my own integrity was on the line for me. And so I needed to keep going. I think that is really the key. You know, a lot of times when it comes down to it, like, I think if we, and it's a hard thing, right? Because I think, it takes deep introspection and it also takes um, a lot of like self-awareness and internally that motivation needs to be there. And, you know, we all like to do that and we all think we do that. But from time to time, I think one of these things just, I think gets a little bit weaker or maybe it's just not there yet. Um, I think what you, what you shared there kind of reminds me of something that we talk a lot in PM Dojo and that is, you know, not just learning, because I think a lot of times when people try to learn a new skill, I think they just learn, which is fine and it might work. But I think we have to spend time in learning how to learn because that itself, I think, is a very different process. And I think it stays with you long term and it's much more internalized, that type of learning. And then I think also unlearning, right, which is, I think, some of the things that I was catching as you were talking about it. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Again, I think looking back, I, I want to unpack and unpeel, like uh, peel some of the layers from your career, Rihanna. And, um, what were some of the what were some of the beliefs? So we talked about a lot of the things that you've had over the years that has kind of helped you move forward, you know. But what were some mm -hmm. of the beliefs or chances or risks that you took 
because you thought they're going to work out. But somehow it didn't. Oh, the least little chance I took that I thought would work out, but it didn't. Mm. Well, I mean, I've had plenty of times when, in terms of building product, where I've thought, this is going to be great. <laughs> and of course, it's not, right? Actually, we have a, a live example at the moment of something that um, I was, you know, something that we need to change and I was like no this is terrible we've got to get rid of this thing it's just awful blah blah blah, blah. completely convinced and right this in my view and then we start testing as we should and the one thing that all the users love about our existing thing is the thing I was convinced we had to get rid of <laughs> this is why we test um in terms of the career thing I um I don't I guess I don't really feel like career stuff I think mostly because I've been fortunate. I mean, there are some roles I've had that I've enjoyed more than others, um, but I've learned something from every single one. And I've learned something more about what I like and what I enjoy so that the the percentage of good to bad keeps getting higher, if that makes sense. So um, the more I've had a chance to experience different environments, different workplaces, different setups, different categories, all sorts of things, the more I'm able to hone in on, okay, this is where I can really shine. And this is where I can add value, but also this is what I actually enjoy. And from an energy point of view, I feel... Um, filled up by rather than trained um, and so I wouldn't um, yeah I wouldn't say that there are things that haven't worked out there are certain patterns like I mean I've often I, I, um, I, I had this really interesting conversation with an entrepreneur in New Zealand a few years ago who who said you need to and this is I think everyone should listen to this advice he said you need to understand what stage of company works for you and he was like for, for this guy for example he was perfect at from you know employee one to employee 50. he, he didn't scale beyond that he wasn't interested in that um do you want to be pre-funding post-funding pre-liquidity event post-liquidity event public private you know this kind of stuff um what sort of size what sort of category product or service or combination and when you understand what works for you and where your sweet spot is then you can and that's what i've spent quite a bit of time I, once i kind of had this light bulb moment from him i looked back over my career and looked at where was i happiest where did i feel like i had most leverage and most impact and i realized that for me it's um it's it's pre-public actually public companies not so much for me <laughs> and um so pre-public but post money like pre-money is just too too risky for me i have a family i need to support um and you know 500 people and above i i keep i, I find them constantly like in smaller orgs we get bigger and then i'm running away from the big org <laughs> to join a smaller org again and this is a clear pattern in, in my career um and so those are the sort of things i can see starting to happen but i don't you know when i've been in huge orgs i don't regret that i just go okay yeah that's how big orgs work that's what i've needed to understand this is what you need to do when you're in those orgs at this point i want to make that trade off or i don't you know so it's um i think it's the thing that the, all those things have helped me do is mean that each choice is each successive role has more like every role has work in it but the proportion of enjoyment to oh, i just got to get this done the, it, it, the the enjoyment proportion gets bigger and bigger the more that clarity comes it's, it's such an important point because I think a lot of times, like uh, when I have conversations with, you know, PMs and product leaders, I think a lot of time it goes into um, things such as, you know, specific domain or a specific title or a specific thing. And I think a lot of times it comes, comes down to, I think, assessing and looking at like what else is going on in my life. And maybe, maybe someone would have been perfect for, let's say, a uh, a growth stage company or a pre-product market fit company but then let's say you have family and suddenly that thing that gave you a lot of joy and fueled you to move forward kind of doesn't stop working like i know it happened with me as well like i think i just geek on pre-product market fit fuzzy zero to one problem spaces and you know after a few years like when i returned back to canada from the bay area i went back to there because i just loved that space but I returned back to Canada as a, as a first time new mom. Mm. And suddenly I felt like totally out of water and out of depth. And I was wondering, I'm like, okay, maybe I've just lost my ability to think because I'm a mom now. Like I just can't think, but it wasn't none of, it was none of those. It was really the fact that my brain and my mm. mind and everything was kind of divided and it didn't work. And then later on it worked. And so I think I, I, I just love that. Um, 
Rihanna, and I and I think the way you kind of answer it answer that question, it also made me realize more and more something that I say, which is most decisions in life are reversible, and mm -hmm. so you know we shouldn't. I think think about it like oh my god this is like the end like if i don't get it right like if i don't get this next role right like that's it it's the end i mean you learn you experiment right and you figure out if it doesn't work you know there's always you can always leave i know it's product pm interviews are very very crazy um but thank you thank you for sharing that i'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to take an uh, audience question if that's okay i think we're getting lots of questions here um so oh, i'm gonna see two really <laughs> I'm going to take something, um, and this question goes, uh, something that I've noticed as I've risen up the ranks and looking at profiles of chief product officers is that they have MBAs. What is, uh, in your opinion, why are some companies looking for folks with MBAs and whether you think that that makes a big difference? This is coming from someone who does not have an MBA. It's a great question. Yeah. It is a great question. I don't have an MBA. Um, and I'll tell you what, I don't think it's actually got anything to do with the MBA. I think it's got something to do with that actually connects to a couple of other questions in there. Um, one about the outcome related and one about what changed for me. Um, the folks who have gone through an MBA are, have a really good grounding or training in being able to speak the language of capital. So they speak outcome language right some better than others maybe <laughs> but they have that training um just as folks who come up through finance can do it because that's just the that's the language that they're trained in um there's a really great um saying from susan colantuomo who's an amazing us um, coach who talks about numbers up people down numbers up people down numbers up people down like just that and that is the mantra that i once i adopted that and was able to really use that to frame my language that really helped me shift um because Honestly, as a very successful people leader and um, leader of teams and cross-functional teams, I, I usually thought people first. And, you know, my passion is users and insight. And so I was thinking people first all the time, which is, I actually do think important in terms of building product, but not in terms of having the conversation with the C-suite, right? Like numbers up, people down. And in leading with that, um, this is the business outcome, being able to talk about the PL, being able to understand what the PL is. I always say that my PMs, you need to fall in love with the PL because the PL is revealed strategy. You know, the company will say, this is our strategy. The PL is the is the revealed strategy. That's what's really going on. <laughs> That's where the revenue really comes from. That's what really drives the company and drives change and decisions in the company. And once you understand that and you're able to speak to that, then you are speaking the language of the CEO and the board. And and so then they start to think, oh hey, this person gets it. Like they know what we need to do i can trust them because they sound and feel like me uh, and i know it's, maybe it shouldn't be like that but it is it is the way humans work um and so i i don't think the mba itself is necessary I, in fact i've never worked with anyone who has used anything from the mba apart from the ability to use that language so you see the same like when you work with ex-consultants someone who worked at mckinsey or bcg they can do the same language right someone who is ex-finance it's just about having that ability to talk from an outcomes basis and the language of capital numbers first um, and that's that's the critical thing yeah I, I i love this um you know th this is like one of the hottest topics that keeps on coming as i'm coaching a lot of women because and not just women like just just different product leaders at different uh stages of their career and i've and, I, and i've shared a few things like i don't think mba i mean if you have it great i'm all for education um, yep. you know, 100%. But classroom training doesn't prepare you for what the real world is. And I think you're 100% right. It's the ability to talk in a language that your C-suite understands, because this was something one of my bosses had mentioned to me years ago. And he said, your, your C-suite, the people sitting in the boardroom, they haven't gone and taken a product management course. So stop coming and talking in PM language and PM jargon. Talk in common sense and talk in the business language, like just, just lay it out there. And the more I started talking about and really understanding some of the capital terminologies and how does that impact the business and then connect it back with the product, it, it just skyrocketed. I think it was a game changer in my career. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, for me, yeah, for me too. And the thing about sponsors, you know, I mean, that's often classic advice given to women and I think it's quite, misleading advice. I mean, sponsors are really helpful when you want to move into product, right? Most people make their first move into product internally because they've done the work getting to know someone in the product org who's like, yeah, this person's great, and blah, blah. I mean, I was sponsored into product by that CPO who really also taught me an enormous amount. And 
when you make those st- like you it's not a sponsor who's going to appoint you to a c-suite role it's and most people don't make c-suite within their own company sometimes but often you have to go outside and it's going to be some ceo who doesn't know you who only knows how you're able to communicate to her or to him um hopefully her um about how you can drive value for her business and so that's the um yeah it's it, you it numbers up people down and their ability to talk about outcomes that's the thing that makes all the difference I, I love that you brought that because I think, again, that is one of the things that we keep on hearing. Well, I need a sponsor. I need a mentor like to advance And all of these things by itself can help, but they do not guarantee a promotion because at the end of the day, it comes down to your credibility. Like, are you able to get the job done and are you able to prove that you can get the job done, especially if you're looking for that next level up? Uh-huh. And it's like, it's the wrong way around. People talk about the sponsor, but if you can talk in the language of outcomes in the business, you will get your sponsor and your mentor really easily. And because the, the thing is, it's not um, like the, the way the sausage is made, that the promotion, when people are sitting around the table talking about the promotion, is the person who is your directly responsible manager will advance you for a promotion, but everybody else around the table has to agree or disagree. And if they know nothing about you, they'll be like, I don't know her, who is she? What's she done? She's done nothing for me. Because if they can say, oh yeah, I know her, she did that really great thing that had that impact and like trot out the little mean that you've planted in their head because you've communicated the business outcome and you've done the work and communicating it then that's how you get the sponsorship at the table for the promotion to happen because it's not logical or fair it happens behind closed doors and it happens in discussion and it's about humans negotiating with humans and so you need to give them the means to make them all look and feel good together about it yeah i mean this is uh, so relevant i was actually coaching a pm just before our um just before the the LinkedIn Live, this was exactly uh, the, the the topic that we we're talking about because she's preparing for that conversation about promotion with her manager tomorrow. And 100%, I mean, you know, she was focused a lot on, and she kept on telling me that my manager supports and he has said, and I'm like, yeah, but do you know if your manager is going to be in the closed room where promotion decisions are being made? And she's like, she's like, no. I said, well, then who's going to be talking about you and who's going to be connecting because everyone's going to be vouching for a person that they want to bring to the table to get promoted. Yeah, yeah, I I, I love this. I love this. Um, And and folks, I'm receiving private messages with your questions. I won't be able to see them. So if you have a question that you'd love for us to talk about, please add them in the comments here and not as a private email or a DM or an email to me because I am not looking at any of those. Uh, but let's let's kind of move on. Um, Rhiannon, let's kind of talk a little bit about product leadership in C-suite from a product standpoint. Um, what is the one critical thing that you have seen that let's say an aspiring product leader, they need to start thinking about and something that they can start applying like right away, let's say tomorrow? Like, what is that one thing that most people miss, maybe? I mean, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I think we've covered it. You know, it's it's a numbers up, people down, but also the work of communicating that. And this is the bit that um, this is where I'm going to be really controversial. Um, I see, I get contacted probably every week by someone who's got a startup, who's going to automate the work of stakeholder management or automate the work of communicating the product. I'm like, that is the work. You can't automate that around away. You know, the you have to do the work. This is the thing. Like often, and I think particularly as women, we are taught. You know, the work should speak for itself. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but work is inert. It cannot speak for itself, right? You have to speak on behalf of the work. You have to speak on behalf of the work your team has done and the results that have been delivered. And by doing that speaking, and if it's too uncomfortable for you to think about it in terms of, because it often is, you know, socially for us very uncomfortable to think. Oh, it's a team. It was us. It's not just me. Oh my God, that's gross. If I do that, I'm going to be sealing the alignment. They're going to hate me. All that stuff, right? You can get rid of that if you think, okay, it's not about me. It doesn't have to be about I did this. We and the team delivered this and call out some people in particular who did great work. But here's the truth. And here's the, like, the awkward thing about politics. Whoever holds the pen controls the message. And so Winston Churchill was once asked, Um, what do you think history will think of you, Prime Minister Churchill? And he said, I know history will look fondly on me because I will write it. And so you write the email or you write the Slack message or you write the thing that celebrates the work that the team is doing and links to the business outcome. And the people in the C-suite remember 
that you were connected with it and that you led it, they're not going to see you as a glory hog because you're going to credit the other people and you're going to do the right thing in terms of showing the impact. And but but they'll also see that you're a leader because you brought people together and that you delivered through other people, which is the definition of leadership, right? So that's it. Like just do the work and grind it out over and over again. Like set yourself a goal. I used to. Um, I used to have a, a goal. I mean, it's kind of different where we're at now and sizes, but you know, like once a week, I would send an email that would have a summary of something that had been achieved and an impact. And I would send that email to my boss and maybe a couple of his or her peer, or they actually always his peers, um, and make sure that that good news about the team and what we were doing was being spread. And the more I did that, the more people would want to be on that email because everybody likes good news. You know, like everybody wants to hear, hey, this is something that's going well. Um, and everywhere I've been where I've done that, it's always been a way to build that credibility and that profile on behalf of the team but also it's a you know very classic example of enlightened self-interest because if you're the if you know if you're the one bearing the good news then you're that remains in people's minds yeah i i love this um i absolutely love this and I, you know um I, I i used to struggle with this a lot i think just like a lot of women uh because we get told right like you have to just do your work quietly like don't just take up space don't um, a little bit is cultural as well, potentially, I think, for a lot of us. But I remember one of uh, well, VP of sales many years ago uh, pulled me aside and uh, mentioned it to me that um, humility and confidence, because the, what, what I was doing by not speaking about my work was that it was actually impacting my confidence. And somehow everybody else in the office assumed that I really lacked confidence because I was not speaking. And so because I was not speaking, someone else was doing the talking and communicating, just like what you said. And I was just getting more and more frustrated because I was considering all of this to be politics. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, that just sounds so bad. Like, I don't want to go and talk about all of this. I'm just going to quietly work. And if my work is good, someone should be seeing it. But then the VP of sales, he called me out and he said, you can still be humble and you can still be grounded, but you can, at the same time, you can also be confident, like you have to find your way of doing it. And just the advice was that you need to start talking about what the team did. And exactly. You yeah, know, it doesn't have to be. And, and just even think about it as the work, like to talk about the work can't speak for itself. It literally can't. It has no ability to do that. And so, and if you and you know, if that stuff is awkward, <laughs> again, this um, amazing CPO who transitioned me into product, he used to do this thing that was so brilliant where he would, he was a relentless promoter of those of us who had his, his direct reports. He had three of us who were VPs of product. And he was so good about shining a light on what we had done and making sure the CEO and the rest of the C-suite knew that we were delivering and doing great results. And that was really good. Effect. Like it was, it was a really great example of the right thing to do is also the smart thing to do because it was a really great thing to do. And I have adopted that and I make sure I always do that with my team. And it also meant that the wider discussion was like, oh, he is such a great leader. Look at his team. Look how amazing they are. <laughs> and so like it really, it was really, you know, it was really good. And I always make sure to, you know, I don't know if you, what people do, you know, but if people do, there's various forms. Some people use software, some people use other things, but to do like a weekly check-in with whoever I report to, where I update them on what's going on. And, um, and I always make sure to put a little bit in each week about someone on the team and something that they are doing that's good and that's worth shining a light on that the person above me is probably not going to see because they're just not close to that work, right? So you don't have to just do it on, it's like, you can, you can take it away from worrying that it's about yourself and do it on behalf of the, on behalf of the team and on behalf of the work, and you'll have the same outcome. Absolutely. And, you know, you can do this as an IC PM. You can, of course, do this as a people leader as well. But, you know, let's not just wait for someone else to do it, like start doing just small things. Right. But it's yeah. so important. So important. Um, I and do look, the thing is, the thing just uh, and the other reason, like when I say everyone loves good news, like when you're in a C-suite role, most of your job is dealing with is just is kind of, is being like, OK, which thing is the most on fire? Oh, that's the, and that's not so on fire. So I'm going to deal with that. Like everything, there's very few things that you work on that are like just going. Everything's swimming and it's no problem, right? Like you, you, if you're working on it, it's because you need like it needs some attention. So when people bring you good news, it's great. You know, you want to hear it because it's energizing for you as a leader. It helps balance the picture about what's going on. Um, and so it's not. It's never a bother. There's no C-suite person on the face of this planet who's going to complain about hearing good news or hearing updates from folks in the org. That's it's honestly the thing that we all look forward to. So yeah, absolutely, it's well worth doing. In the language that they understand. And yeah, they yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, this is a really great question in the comment section, Rihanna. And so I'm going to take this and then I'm going to move back to our questions. Um, how did you uplift your emotions when you had to take, you know, like a one step forward, two steps back? If that's a great question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I had loads of moments like that. Um, loads. Um, when I was in politics, I spent a lot of time thinking about, because I had this huge... Um, when I was a political staff, I'm not, not a politician, um, I had, because I had this enormous click about management and I thought, hmm, I actually really love this and I think I want to I want to go as far as I can. So I spent a lot of time thinking about how do women end up in positions of senior, senior management, C-suite type positions in organisations and did a lot of research. And I, I read this really interesting interview with a woman who was very senior at Procter & Gamble and who said sometimes you have to take a step sideways or a step back to get to where you want to. And I could see that in terms of my discipline, I was in a little bit of a dead end. So I needed to take a step sideways or a step down to shift closer to the heart of the business because the way that you get to be is you've got to be as close to the heart of the business as possible, which is why product is amazing and we are all so lucky to work in product. And this is why the discipline is wonderful because we're right at the heart of the business and software businesses. Um, and so when I left that and went to the BBC, I, I mean, I had been the director of communications and research in the prime minister's office and I went to being a marketing planning manager with one direct report and like, you know, I was basically an individual contributor again, you know, after having had a team of however many teams and teams and lots of people and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I got to do the work and get the the, the proof on my CV that I could do these things that was moving me closer to where I wanted to be in terms of the heart of the business. Um, so, you know, in terms of the emotions, I was more like, well, this is getting me towards where I want to go, so I'm going to stick it out. And it's, it was actually really useful and I learned loads. And when we moved home to New Zealand, um, it was great from a family point of view, but there were a couple of moments there when, actually, I remember this is really one particular moment when um, we've been home maybe nine months and um, it was nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and I was in the supermarket pushing the trolley trolley with my 15 month old in the thing. And I felt really sick because I was pregnant with number two and really nauseated. And over the sound speaker comes a song by a band. It's a great track. And the last time I'd heard that track, they'd been playing it live for us in a club in LA for us just to have a vet. And I was like, oh man, what is my life? You know, like, what have I done? Have I taken my entire career? You know, I've moved home. Like New Zealand, what's going on down here? Here I am, sick in the supermarket on Saturday morning. And it was a moment where I thought, you know, and I had another couple of moments. It took, me, it took us a while to kind of settle back in. There was a moment where I said no to a really big opportunity to move back to the US, but it was the wrong thing for our family at that time. And that was really hard. Like that was a very, very hard decision. And I felt very low about that for a long Like it was the right thing from the family point of view. And it felt like a, whew, I'm making a big trade off here. And by sticking it out and by doing that, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, I can wallow in feeling a bit crappy here or I can think, well, I'm in product. What do we tell everybody to do? Product 101, I'm going to do some discovery. Mm -hmm. And so I went on a huge discovery tour of product in Auckland and New Zealand that just talked to loads and just did basically informational interviewing, and which is how I ended up in the role at Bend, in my, so in my first C-suite role. So the role, that big opportunity in the US was not a C-suite role, whereas I got that first role by actually sticking it out and my third baby <laughs> which was way better than that role um at, at home and so by kind of sitting with it and and going okay there's a reason why we make these trade-offs everything is transitory <laughs> what is the work to do to go through to the next stage and then see how that goes and, and that you know that's kind of how um manage those those you know those ups and downs and then even within you know within every role there are moments when you think oh am i right like this is not working and then eventually you know like things will yeah you, yeah you've got to stick with it yeah. it's 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 it, i think as i was listening to you it's all about i think playing the long game and it's mm -hmm. extremely hard because oftentimes you can't see it through and mm -hmm. you know, we are only seeing the next option and we're comparing it with one step like our current situation and i think that's where it feels like, well, I'm going 10 steps back or I'm taking a demotion or, you know, I'm going to be making less. Um, but I think if you start kind of, I think, trusting in your gut and your instinct a little bit. And at the end of the day, I mean, everything, like you said, is temporary. Right. And I think looking back like, and what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I, uh, yeah, I, I, it's 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 amazing. Um, I think to hear from you that way. I remember uh, Tanish, my nine-year-old, was sharing with me this a few weeks ago, 
like he's kind of he's like almost like my therapist that I don't have to pay for. well I am paying for a lot of stuff for him. so you are paying for him <laughs> but I'm not paying a therapist but I was feeling really low and I almost felt like giving up everything that I was doing and I felt like I was like shit like you know I I think I should just like go back to the corporate right uh, I should stop doing what I'm doing like entrepreneurship like this is really hard you know like this is just not going to happen and he kind of was listening to me venting and complaining to my husband and he was doing his Legos on the side. And then he comes to me, gives me a hug and he says, mom, just think of life as riding a wave. You know, you've had this four or five years of like really being on the high. Now the wave is crashing. Just wait for the next one. I'm like, oh my God, that is so, so wise. He's spot on. That is, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's just that. Um, and I was yeah. like, thanks buddy. Like I just needed that pep talk and he made it so simple. Yeah. And I think oftentimes we make it so complicated, but thank you for that perspective. Um, I'm going to come to motherhood because I know that a lot of people are wanting, I don't know, it's the formula, the hack, the solution. Um, I haven't found one. I'd love to hear from you. And that is, how do you balance this high profile product executive role in the C-suite with motherhood like i know i go crazy with one you have three amazing kids how do you do that and how do you maintain balance equilibri equilibrium whatever that sense is how do you how do you get that yeah i think this is a super interesting question because i um, and i think there's probably three things that i talk about. i mean first i am in a very unusual and very lucky position in that my husband um, is full-time with our kids so um, if there's one thing the patriarchy got right, is <laughs> having someone full time at home sure does make things easier. Um, even though it is really hard, really hard for the person at home. It's much harder, I think, than being one going to work. Um, so, I mean, like first and foremost, Anthony is how we manage that as a family and it's thanks to him. Um, I think secondly, though, um, I, I just don't, I just don't buy the question. I just don't think that there is balance or equilibrium or, or like this idea. There's just a lot of stuff that I don't do anymore. Um, I mean, my life is quite like I go to work and I come home and those are the only two things I prioritize. And there are some tiny little bits around the side. You know, I, I have a, a call with my close friend from when I was at high school for half an hour once a week, but like, that's it. Right. And I talk to my parents for 15 minutes each once a week. But I mean, I'm really like, it's really, life is very telescoped down to, to making those choices because I want to be really present with the kids when I'm home. You know, he's making this huge, huge commitment to do. I don't want to be like, I'm too tired. I can't be with him. I need to be a committed, present parent when I'm there and help and carry my share. And I need the kids to see that. Um, so I, it's just like in so many things down to little, little details. You know, we were talking about this earlier, like, this is going to sound ridiculous, but you know, before I had kids, I went to the salon every six weeks. I had a really lovely hairstyle that I maintained and then I washed every day, like all this kind of stuff. I don't do that anymore, right? Like I, I chose, I do stuff and I have like, ha like self care routines that means that I don't have to wash my hair every day because I don't have time, you know, like that kind of stuff, like that level of like just, just letting go of stuff. And I had to let go of some things professionally that were quite important to my identity or beliefs that I had um, because it's just not possible to do it all. But that's, sort of okay. And then the third thing is that I actually think having the kids has made me way better at my job in two really critical ways. Um, so one of the pieces of feedback that I used to get um, a, a long time ago now, thankfully, um, but that, you know, oh, you're not data driven enough. Um, and I, I believed that, I internalized that. I was like, oh, I'm not data driven enough. I'm not data driven enough. And I, you know, we're constantly trying to find, but actually I was massively data driven because I was entirely insight driven, but I had, internalize that language and I believed it about myself and I believed that this was my great flaw and that I had to fix it and then we had the problems getting pregnant and I started to get really interested in data and then when we had our son he was um, born a little bit early and there was a lot of work that we had to do like a lot of work and a lot of data that we had to manage and collect to make sure that he was okay because otherwise he wouldn't have been um, and that and I was like oh, hang on a minute this is the most stressful thing in my life. Like we're trying to keep this kid alive and do this stuff. And I'm obsessed with the data and I'm recording the data and analyzing it. And, you know, like every three hours tracking all this stuff, I'm like, actually, I am data driven. What's, hang on a minute. What's this people have been telling me? And it's not true. It wasn't that I wasn't data driven. I wasn't using the language, the thing that we've been talking before, the outcomes language or the numbers up, people down. I had been leading with talking about the people. And the fact of the matter is, C-suite people don't have much time. And I know this now, that we just don't have much time. Again, that amazing CPO I mentioned, he used to hold up his hand and say, Rhiannon, 
between your finger and your thumb. Your email cannot be longer than that. And he'd hold up his hand, which is bigger. And he'd say, my hand's bigger so I can write more. Sucks for you. You've got to get it short. You know, like he was, re- he was right. You just don't have time. And so if I'd start with the people and then they'd just drift off before I got to numbers. So it's not that I wasn't data driven and I had internalized this feedback. Actually, I was. I just wasn't using the right language. But having the kids made me go, no, that's not right. That feedback is wrong. I am really deeply data driven. This is really core to my personality and to how I live. And actually, it gave me the confidence to push back and realize, no, this is not a flaw in me that I need to fix. There's something in the communication loop here and fix that instead, which has had huge flow on impact and benefit for my career. And then the second thing was prioritization. I know it seems obvious, but like PMing is all about prioritization. And I remember before we had, when I was pregnant with um, with our oldest, you know, Anthony saying to me, you can't be doing those 12 hour days in the office. Like I am gonna be here and I'm gonna do it full time with the kid, but you pull your weight, you don't do 12 hours in the office, you come home after eight. Like, but it's America, you know, it's Silicon Valley, it's supposed to be like work, work, work all the time. I can't do that. It's gonna be really scary. As soon as I had him, it was so easy. It was so easy to shut down my computer at quarter to five and say, I'm out of here and walk home. And then, you know, maybe I'd be online later on when he was in bed, but, like, mm. it's really easy to prioritize when you understand what's really important and that, and you know, how that stuff works. And so, because my life also changed in terms of, I just didn't have as much sleep. Like I was chronically tired all the time. You know, I was nursing or pregnant for six years and sometimes nursing and pregnant at the same time for six years straight. You know, like I just, and nursing every two hours through the night for six years. Like it's not, like I had no, it was just a bunch of stuff that I had to figure out how to prioritize and how to crunch things down and what was important and what was high leverage and let go of the things that weren't high leverage. So I got better, I think, in my career as a result. So the, I guess I'm saying like this whole thing about who you're with is really important. The second thing about um, it's, there is no there is no balance. It's just not. It's just about what trade-offs are you willing to make at which time um, and kind of accepting that. And then actually leaning into, you know, what, what does it make you better at? Because I think it does make you better at a lot of things. I love this. Um, you know, and, and I and I hundred percent agree. It's I think the balance word, um, I, I've just started detesting it because most like, uh, I don't think there was balance before. And then definitely there is no balance because always there is something that is off that you're not doing. And um, something that I remind myself a lot over the years, at least for the last nine years, Rihanna, since I've been like a mom, is uh, in order to prioritize something, like I have to deprioritize something else. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, and it's it's just that, like, you know, we've outsourced our cooking because we can mm-hmm. make some time here. Like, you know, I don't do everything. I've cut down on so many things. But But what I wanted to ask you, and I don't know how comfortable you're answering this, but does it make... Do you feel guilty? Like, do you, yeah, the guilt, the dreaded guilt, yes. Mm. Okay, this is a great question. And um, uh, mm, not guilty, um, but I did the thing, and this is, nobody talks about this. So if this is something that you listening have experienced or felt, I hope it, yeah. Um, Children attached to, most to the person who was their primary caregiver and i was not that kid's primary caregiver after he was three months old and i was back at work and so um and once i stopped nursing i didn't have the thing that he wanted when he was comforted anymore and so you no no like this is for reals and i've met a few other women who've experienced this but it's so and i was like i thought i'm i had not realized to what extent in my head my belief was mother equals i'm the one he wants when he's sad but I was not the one he wanted when he was sad. He wanted his dad because his dad was there every hour of the day when he fell over and I wasn't, I was off at the office having my good old adult life. And like, that was really hard. You know, for a long time, I wasn't guilty, but I was really sad that, that you know, this little kid who was the center of my world, I was not the center of his. I was really important, but I was just, it was just slightly adjacent to the center of his world. And I could see and feel that. And yeah, right, you feel it too, right? Like it's, and it's in, it's really intense because it was really like, I had no idea how deep that belief in me was that that was what was gonna happen and that was how it should be. And then to see it not be like that, I probably shouldn't use the F word on LinkedIn Live, but man, it was, it was a big, you know, I really struggled that for a long time. Um, and I, some, you know, and then we had, we had, it's different with the other kids because by the time they came along, there was like more, you know, they weren't so singular, you know, they always had other kids. There was always attention being split. So I don't think they 
lived it or expressed it as intensely as number one does or still does actually i remember him saying to me once you know you know i love dad more and i'm like yeah you do love dad more he's like i love you I and mean, he loves me but i know this too from the other way right like we all we all know this we don't talk about it but we have these feelings inside he loves me to bits and i love him to bits and now that he's older sometimes that little bit of distance is actually quite helpful i don't know if you have you know like with one parent you're so close but you also get a bit scratchy with them he and I don't, you know, he says to me, he, you know, he said like, you know, I love Dan, but also, but you understand me better, you know, like, so we can have a different relationship now and that fills that gap in my heart more. But there was years there when I would look at it and go, okay, this is the choice I made. And this is a consequence that I did not realize would come from this choice. And there it is right there when you fall over and you cry and you ask for dad before me, you know? Oh, so yeah, I didn't feel guilty, but that's what I have felt. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that. Oh my God, like, uh, yeah, I, I could go on and on and on about about all of that. And yeah, it's it's very real. I mean, we have this thing where my son now, I don't know why we did that, but we were just having dinner and uh, my husband asked him, you know, so who do you love more? I don't know why we did that. That was like a really bad, bad or not the right question to ask. At first, you know, he looked at me, then he looked at my husband. I knew what he was going to say. And, uh, and, and then, you know, he's like, oh, I love you both. That's the right answer, he said, that I should give. But then he kind of looked at, you know, my husband and kind of gave the most beautiful smile. I just knew that they had that special connection. And I'm like, oh, my God. Yeah. Why? 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 Right? And it's like a stab to the heart. And at that point you go, because I, I, I'd never... I'd never interrogated, but realized to what extent in my head, mother equals yes. most important person in that world, in that kid's world, and that's actually not always the case. <laughs> I just reacted right. I'm like, what do you mean? Like when you get hurt, you don't go to dad. You come to me. You know why do you come to me? You should go to dad. But I shouldn't have done that. But I think it was just me reacting to a reality. And yes, the trade off. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know we are sorry. This freaked everybody out. Like nobody, and this is, I don't. I don't really hear people talk about it much at all. No. The other stuff I hear people talk about. I even hear people talk about infertility. Um, okay, she, yeah, I see you. Yeah, no, and like I've I've had a couple of quiet conversations with other women who have been like the primary breadwinner winner, and they'll sort of quietly admit it to me, and I'm like, yeah, mate, like it's. Yeah. But this is where I think it's also. I think men experience this all the time. And we don't give them the space to um, yes. 100%. Like, realize how big a deal that is as well. 100%, yeah. 100%, 100%. I know we are very close to the hour, Rihanna, and, and we have so many other questions to talk about. But I think what unconventional, I think one question that I want to ask you, and I know we've talked about the capital and the, the commercial skills and all of that, but is there uh, unconventional advice that you would want to give to aspiring product leaders, um, especially women, or if you want to keep it gender neutral, that's totally fine, as they're trying to navigate that next level in the C-suite or maybe a very senior product leadership role? Unconventional. Unconventional, so not the usual. <laughs> Beyond everything that we've, well, I, I think a lot of what we've talked about is becoming usual now, but I don't think it has been for a long time. Um, so I, I think that's right. I think also um, uh, you kind of have to, mm. oh, now I'm just have to try and make something up. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, I mean, the, like the classic stuff is what we talked about, or the, the real stuff that people don't necessarily tell you about is that stuff. And then also, I think there's also, actually, here's the one thing I will say that is perhaps unconventional, but is true as well, is that, um, and it links back to a question that somebody had in there earlier that we didn't address. Um, you can't control everything, right? So like opportunity is luck meets preparation, right? And so you, you, you can do all these things and you need to do all these things and you still need to meet, meet people with whom you have a connection and who have the role and the opportunity and who will invite you into their, their thing that they're doing to do that. And you can't, um, 
you know, that I, I couldn't control, I could do all my product discovery, get out there across New Zealand and meet loads of people, do all my language. And I did all of that for months and months and months. And then that it worked out that I met that CEO who was looking to hire a CPO and who blah, blah, blah. And it worked and it worked, but it was that circumstance at that point and that time with that person and me and a bunch of other things. And I can't control, you can't control what's on the other side. You can control how you show up, but you can't control where the opportunities are and what's going on with other folks. And so I think there is some... Like, this is really important to know what you want, say what you want, and then be able to wait. And all three of those are really important. Like, knowing what you want is actually quite hard. Saying it is really hard. We've just talked about how hard it is to say these things. But then sometimes you just got to wait. And for, and, and for senior roles in particular, they don't come along every day, right? Like, it's, you do need to be able to sit with it for a while and sit with the, the um, discomfort of, I want this, I've done the work, I think I'm ready, but the right mm-hmm. thing hasn't come up yet. And you just have to keep the faith and keep going. I, I love this. I love this. I'm sorry for putting you on the spot, um, asking for this unconventional advice. Uh, I think as you were kind of saying this around and something that caught my eye is a lot of times, I think we um, think what we want because that's what others keep on talking about. And I think it really needs some reflection and introspection to figure out what is it that I really want. Uh, because it is most of the time it might not match with what society or with your what your friends mm-hmm. or what the common advice is. Um, and I know we didn't touch one question, but I think just uh, just as you were talking about it, I think the executive presence, especially for women, like I would say ditch that. Although I actually have a view on this. Um, it's quite it's actually quite easy. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, presence is made up of two things, um, or executive presence. It's made up of, um, or it, it's, um, it's made up of two things. It's made up of um, uh, like attraction and gravitas. And attraction or charisma is, I am excited to be here. You need to be able to communicate passion and energy about being there. But that's not enough. You need gravitas as well. And the gravitas, the underpinning thought there is, and I have a right to be here. Right. So when you've done the work and you know that you have the right to be there and what you're saying, when you bring those two together, you bring your passion and therefore you'll be charismatic as you talk about it and your gravitas in terms of I have a right to be here. I know that because I've done the work. Then you have executive presence done. It's actually just it's actually a formula. And when you have you bring those two together and you can work through it and you can write it out. Like, why am I excited and passionate? Why do I have authority to be here? And if you're not sure, you can work it out and write it out in your own head. And then you just channel that into what you're saying. Uh, so, so, that, so why do women get told this a lot and why not men? Or is it just that we don't hear from men? Because we don't answer the second question for ourselves. We're really good. Socially, we're allowed to express passion and excitement a lot, um, but we don't answer this whole thing about imposter syndrome, how we have imposter syndrome, blah, blah, blah. Of course, it's true. But we talk ourselves out of the second one. We talk ourselves out of the, I have a right to be here. The gravitas part is critical. You have to follow through on that second part. And actually... The whole thing about doing the work and then not talking about the work like mostly women have done the work they do have the right to be there because of the imposter syndrome because of the anxiety they like cross all the t's and dot all the i's they've done the work you have the right to be there they, you've just got to formulate that sentence in your in the way that you speak and then so then you bring the two together love it what a way to end this conversation Rhiannon thank you so much I absolutely loved every second talking to you and I know you're receiving a lot of love on the chat as well so so excited and again thank you folks for joining this has been so amazing Um, loved all the questions and again thank you for joining and stay tuned for the next one if you have more questions keep on adding them in the comments I will share some resources as well Um, and again have an amazing amazing week thank you so much and Rhiannon again Lots of gratitude. I So much power to you. Thank you so much. It's inspirational. Thank you, Bosky. And thank you, everyone, for giving some of your time. It's the most precious thing we all have. So I'm grateful to you for spending it with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye.